From all let's bring in townhall.com political editor Guy Benson, along with OutKick founder Clay Travis. Gentlemen, welcome to the bottom line. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Guy, yes. Guy, I want to come to you first. So, again, we talked about the border, crime, inflation, Ukraine. Um, now, Israel, Joe Biden's down 11 points with Democrat voters in the last month. Um, if you look at 2024, does this guy have any chance of getting reelected? He does. Of course he does. But I think those chances have been diminished in recent months. I mean, he's been unpopular since the Afghanistan withdrawal for good reason. And the battle to get reelected would be an uphill climb, I would say, in almost any circumstances, given the struggles that he's dealing with. I mean, independents have flocked away from him. Republicans almost universally will vote against him. Democrats are splintering a bit because I think you've got some on the hard left saying he's too pro-Israel. I've supported him for at least some of his words and some of his policies on that front. But the hard left is really unhappy about that. And then just broadly speaking, you ran through that whole list. A big push from Joe Biden and his supporters and, of course, most journalists in 2020 was you've got chaos on the Trump side of things and you've got sort of this kindly, well-known, older gentleman who will restore normalcy and norms and order and we can finally put so much of the drama behind us. That was a big reason why Biden won in 2020. And now we look around the country and the world and the fires all over the place. And I think a lot of voters will be saying to themselves, OK, I'm sorry, maybe the previous guy wasn't so bad. And all the predictions they were making about him actually apply to the person who won. Yeah, those are all great points. And Clay, you know, if you weren't just completely sort of blown away by Joe Biden's handling of the economy and you're willing to pay more for things and not have savings and put everything on credit cards, you've got to look at this foreign policy and the way he's carrying on, you know, around the world and what sort of start started this and led to this. The fact that our adversaries see us as weak um, and think that people are going to look at this and say, this isn't the guy. I think it's an easy question. And, and to the extent that the 2024 election ends up a referendum on Joe Biden, the question that can be asked is pretty straightforward. What's better now than existed for most Americans in January of 2020? Uh, the answer for most people is everything's worse, whether it's the southern border, whether it's crime, uh, whether it's war in the Middle East and war in Europe. Uh, inflation and what it costs to go out and just buy anything. I mean, here's an easy stat for you that's pretty crazy, but I feel every time I go through the Chick-fil-A drive through to get yes. food for my three boys, fast food prices are up 40% since Joe Biden came into office. 40%? I mean, that's crazy. Uh, I, I was looking the other day, I couldn't believe it. A gallon of orange juice is over $9 in most places now. If, if for people out there who wonder why does the Biden and economics, Bidenomics argument not work, it's because nothing costs what it feels like it should cost in the first three years of Joe Biden's tenure. And so to the extent that that Trump can get out of the way and just make 2024 a referendum on Joe Biden, his age and his failure on virtually every front as president of the United States shouldn't get him four more years. Guy's right, though. It's going to be a close election, but I think right now, if people were going to the polls, Trump would win. It could be those prices go up at Chick-fil-A or it's those boys just keep getting bigger and eating more. Clay, I'm not sure which <laughs> one it is. Well, you know about that better <laughs> than anybody. Yeah, <laughs> they keep eating more. But I can listen. The American people, they're nervous, right? They, 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 they're stressed out about all these things that are going on. But Vice President Kamala Harris has gone out of her way to assure the American people that the president isn't going anywhere despite concerns over his age. Watch. Joe Biden is very much alive and running for re-election. Our democracy is on the line, Bill. And I frankly, in my head, do not have time for parlor games when we have a president who is running for re-election. Guy Benson, Joe Biden's alive. Very much alive. <laughs> very reassuring there. It's like yeah. an important qualifier. Uh, look, I understand that she's making these comments. She has to. But SNL, which hasn't been terribly funny recently. Their episode this past weekend, I actually enjoyed. It opened with this cold open sketch about sort of doddering, very old, somewhat confused Joe Biden. It's becoming mainstream and just unavoidable for people to see what is happening to this man as he ages considerably. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful with that. People can just see it with their eyes and ears. And the polling shows overwhelming concern about his ability to fill out 
this term or certainly a next term as well. So it's not something that people are just making up out of whole cloth. She called it parlor games. I think for most voters, it is a major reality and something that they will be considering at the polls in about 13 months. Well, it's not just the Democrats that are split on the Israel-Hamas conflict as well. 2024 Republican presidential candidates aren't exactly unified here either. Yeah, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump, he's been talking top. Watch. If you spill a drop of American blood, we will spill a gallon of yours. We do not. Meanwhile, Nikki Haley lashing out at the former president's record. Eight years ago, it was good to have a leader who broke things. But right now, we need a leader who also knows how to put things back together. Then you have Vivek Ramaswamy forced to play defense for criticizing Israel's plan to destroy Hamas. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, he's on the ropes after being accused of violating free speech rights after ordering pro-Palestinian student groups in his home state to shut down. Let's get back at it. Um, Clay, I want to ask you about that specifically, um, the sort of outrage that we're seeing in this country over the dialogue um, and some of these anti-Semitic conversations that are, you know, really just permeating our campuses, they're in our cities. You know, when it came to free speech and the pandemic, for example, conservatives were being censored for even questioning a vaccine, a vaccine that we didn't know a lot about. That wasn't allowed to happen. They were being censored. That wasn't free speech. But in this case, you can have people taken to the streets and saying Israelis should be killed and that's okay. That is free speech. Look, I am a huge proponent of the marketplace of ideas because sometimes when people speak loudly, they tell you exactly what they think and they make it clear that they are imbeciles. And I think that's what the left in this country has done as it surrounds this situation. This is not a difficult call. Uh, what the marginal tax rate should be on corporations, we can have a long debate about that. Uh, what you think exactly the, the penalty should be for manslaughter under a modern penal code. Okay, let's argue about that. This was basically uh, Al-Qaeda-like attack. I mean, essentially, right? Hamas should be wiped from the face of the earth. They killed 1,400 innocent Israelis. And I think what we're seeing is many people have lost, on the left in particular, but also in much of America, the ability to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil. What Hamas did was evil. Israel is 100% within their rights to respond. Netanyahu today said, uh, would you have said to America after Pearl Harbor or after 9-11 uh, that we need a ceasefire? Of course not. Israel should wipe Hamas, in my opinion, from the face of the earth once and for all, like we tried to do to ISIS under Trump. This is there's no moral equivalency here. There's no uh, argument about what is a, uh, an appropriate response. Hamas has to be wiped from the face of the earth. They are evil. The fact that so many Americans don't seem capable of staring evil into the face and acknowledging it is a failure. But if that's the debate we need to have, I'm happy to have it. You know, I, I believe in a, uh, uh, a battleground of ideas. I think we should have this debate. And you're seeing it on the Rep in the Republican Party, different ideas, and they're going after each other. And I think there's a good consequence and outcome for that. But, uh, Guy, I I'm concerned when we have Ron DeSantis saying, I'm going to shut down speech. Listen, I don't agree with the pro-Hamas protesters on college campuses. I don't agree with what they're doing when they become violent um, to Jewish students. When it's violence, we should take action. But we should be careful because if we're going to shut down just speech itself, we should be prepared for those same arguments to come back against conservatives on college campus and in the workplace and everywhere else in American life. Yeah, his argument is this is not about free speech or the groups existing. It's about aiding and abetting terrorists and celebrating Jew slaughter. So he says this is in a different category. And I'm sympathetic because some of this speech and some of this conduct has been unbelievably vile beyond anything else that would ever be tolerated at any of these universities. I think we all understand that. But like you, Sean, I am very protective of the First Amendment. I'm not sure it's the best solution for a politician to say preemptively, because of some of these terrible things that have been done or said, we're going to shut down these groups altogether at every state-run institution uh, in, in one state, for example. I think that's too far. I think going after conduct, that is a problem. Going after anything that's violence, anything that would be yes. incitement or direct aid to terrorism, obviously, you lower the boom on that. But I get where he's coming from. I share his spirit of revulsion at these, and they are, let's call them, pro-Hamas hate rallies and hate groups. That's what they are. 
but we protect hate speech in this country. We do. It is free speech. I wish that that standard flowed both ways, that we were all consistent on it. We don't see that from the left very often, but I think you have to be careful uh, and, and strike a very delicate balance here. Switching gears for a moment, um, turn of events that didn't really come as much of a surprise. Former Vice President Mike Pence dropping out of the 2024 race. A new poll out of Iowa saying that this isn't a surprise. Um, Trump still holds a commanding lead among likely Republican voters. But there's been some movement for Nikki Haley, who now is tied with DeSantis for second. Um, Clay, I'll come to you on this. Look, I think Mike Pence made the right decision. It's been quite clear that he wasn't going to be a viable contender. And, and I think really we're down to a three-way race. Uh, we had Tim Scott on the program today. I like Tim Scott. I know next week we'll have another debate. Maybe you can wait a week and see whether there's any movement that comes out of that third Republican debate. But to me, it seems that we have a three-way race right now. Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, and Ron DeSantis. And the question that is going to be out there as we approach Iowa in about 10 weeks is, Who's going to be the clear contender to go after Trump 1v1? And right now, it seems it's either going to be Nikki Haley or it's going to be Ron DeSantis. I think the faster we get to a winnowed field, to a lesser number of people that are out there competing, uh, the better we find out whether Trump's lead is so durable that nobody can challenge him or if it's a 1v1 or a 1v2, uh, whether Trump, who, to be fair, is still only at 43% at Iowa, that suggests that the majority would be opposed to him, uh, whether that can actually translate in Iowa, in New Hampshire, and certainly by the time we get to South Carolina, I think it has to be a 1v1 matchup. That's going to be interesting. Mm. Guy Benson, Clay Travis, thank you guys for joining us. I always appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Thanks a lot.